Chapter Thirty Two. Victorin Hulot, under the overwhelming disasters of his family, had received the finishing touch which makes or mars the man. He was perfection. In the great storms of life, we act like the captain of a ship who, under the stress of a hurricane, lightens the ship of its heaviest cargo. The young lawyer lost his self-conscious pride, his too evident assertiveness, his arrogance as an orator, and his political pretensions. He was as a man what his wife was as a woman. He made up his mind to make the best of his Celestine, who certainly did not realize his dreams, and was wise enough to estimate life at its true value by contenting himself in all things with the second best. He vowed to fulfill his duties, so much had he been shocked by his father's example. These feelings were confirmed as he stood by his mother's bed on the day when she was out of danger nor did this happiness come single claude vignon who called every day from the prince de wissembourg to inquire as to madame hulot's progress desired the re-elected deputy to go with him to see the minister his excellency said he wants to talk over your family affairs with you the prince had long known victorin hulot and received him with a friendliness that promised well my dear fellow said the old soldier I promised your uncle in this room that I would take care of your mother. That saintly woman, I am told, is getting well again. Now is the time to pour oil into your wounds. I have for you here two hundred thousand francs. I will give them to you. The lawyer's gesture was worthy of his uncle, the marshal. Be quite easy, said the prince, smiling. It is money in trust. My days are numbered. I shall not always be here, so take this sum and fill my place towards your family. You may use this money to pay off the mortgage on your house. These two hundred thousand francs are the property of your mother and your sister. If I gave the money to Madame Hulot, I fear that in her devotion to her husband she would be tempted to waste it and the intention of those who restore it to you is that it should produce bread for madame hulot and her daughter the countess steinbock you are a steady man the worthy son of your noble mother the true nephew of my friend the marshal you are appreciated here you see and elsewhere so be the guardian angel of your family and take this as a legacy from your uncle and me monseigneur said hulot taking the minister's hand and pressing it such men as you know that thanks in words mean nothing gratitude must be proven prove yours said the old man in what way by accepting what i have to offer you said the minister we propose to appoint you to be attorney to the war office which just now is involved in litigations in consequence of the plan for fortifying paris consulting clerk also to the prefecture of police and a member of the board of the civil list these three appointments will secure you salaries amounting to eighteen thousand francs and will leave you politically free you can vote in the chamber in obedience to your opinions and your conscience act in perfect freedom on that score it would be a bad thing for us if there were no national opposition also, a few lines from your uncle, written a day or two before he breathed his last, suggested what I could do for your mother, whom he loved very truly. Mesdames Papineau, de Rastignac, de Navarin, d'Espard, de Grandlieu, de Carigliano, de Lenoncourt, and de la Batie have made a place for your mother as a lady superintendent of their charities. These ladies, presidents of various branches of benevolent work, cannot do everything themselves. They need a lady of character who can act for them by going to see the objects of their beneficence, ascertaining that charity is not imposed upon, and whether the help given really reaches those who applied for it, finding out that the poor who are ashamed to beg, and so forth. Your mother will fulfill an angelic function she will be thrown in with none but priests and these charitable ladies she will be paid six thousand francs and the cost of her hackney coaches you see young man that a pure and nobly virtuous man can still assist his family even from the grave 
such a name as your uncle's is and ought to be a buckler against misfortune in a well-organized scheme of society follow in his path you have started in it i know continue in it such delicate kindness cannot surprise me in my mother's friend said victorin i will try to come up to all your hopes go at once and take comfort to your family by the way added the prince as he shook hands with victorin your father has disappeared alas yes so much the better that unhappy man has shown his wit in which indeed he is not lacking there are bills of his to be met well you shall have six months pay of your three appointments in advance this prepayment will help you perhaps to get the notes out of the hands of the money-lender and i will see nucingen and perhaps may succeed in releasing your father's pension pledged to him without its costing you or our office a sou the peer has not killed the banker in nucingen he is insatiable he wants some concession i know not what so on his return to the rue plumet victorin could carry out his plan of lodging his mother and sister under his roof the young lawyer already famous had for his sole fortune one of the handsomest houses in paris purchased in eighteen thirty four in preparation for his marriage situated on the boulevard between the rue de la paix and the rue louis le grand a speculator had built two houses between the boulevard and the street and between these with the gardens and courtyards to the front and back there remained still standing a splendid wing the remains of the magnificent mansion of the verneuil the younger hulot had purchased this fine property on the strength of mademoiselle crevel's marriage portion for one million francs when it was put up to auction paying five hundred thousand down he lived on the ground floor expecting to pay the remainder out of letting the rest but though it is safe to speculate in house property in paris such investments are capricious or hang fire depending on unforeseen circumstances as the parisian lounger may have observed the boulevard between the rue de la paix and the rue louis le grand prospered but slowly it took so long to furbish and beautify itself that trade did not set up its display there till eighteen forty the gold of the money-changers the fairy work of fashion and the luxurious splendor of shop-fronts in spite of two hundred thousand francs given by crevel to his daughter at the time when his vanity was flattered by this marriage before the baron had robbed him of josepha in spite of the two hundred thousand francs paid off by victorin in the course of seven years the property was still burdened with a debt of five hundred thousand francs in consequence of victorin's devotion to his father happily a rise in rents and the advantages of the situation had at this time improved the value of the houses the speculation was justifying itself after eight years patience during which the lawyer had strained every nerve to pay the interest and some trifling amounts of the capital borrowed the tradespeople were ready to offer good rents for the shops on condition of being granted leases for eighteen years the dwelling apartments rose in value by the shifting of the centre in paris life henceforth transferred to the region between the bourse and the madeleine now the seat of the political power and financial authority in paris the money paid to him by the minister added to a year's rent in advance and the premiums paid by his tenants would finally reduce the outstanding debt to two hundred thousand francs the two houses if entirely let would bring in a hundred thousand francs a year within two years more during which the hulots could live on his salaries added to by the marshal's investments victorin would be in a splendid position this was manna from heaven victorin could give up the first floor of his own house to his mother and the second to hortense excepting two rooms reserved for lisbeth with cousin betty as the housekeeper this compound household could bear all these charges and yet keep up a good appearance as beseemed a pleader of note the great stars of the law courts were rapidly disappearing 
and victorin hulot gifted with a shrewd tongue and strict honesty was listened to by the bench and councillors he studied his cases thoroughly and advanced nothing that he could not prove he would not hold every brief that offered in fact he was a credit to the bar the baroness's home in the rue plumet had become so odious to her that she allowed herself to be taken to the rue louis le grand thus by her son's care adeline occupied a fine apartment she was spared all the daily worries of life for lisbeth consented to begin again working wonders of domestic economy such as she had achieved for madame marneffe seeing here a way of exerting her silent vengeance on those three noble lies the object each of her hatred which was kept growing by the overthrow of all her hopes once a month she went to see valerie sent indeed by hortense who wanted news of wenceslas and by celestine who was seriously uneasy at the acknowledged and well-known connection between her father and a woman to whom her mother-in-law and sister-in-law owed their ruin and their sorrows as may be supposed lisbeth took advantage of this to see valerie as often as possible thus about twenty months passed by during which the baroness recovered her health though her palsied trembling never left her she made herself familiar with her duties which afforded her a noble distraction from her sorrow and constant food for the divine goodness of her heart she also regarded it as an opportunity for finding her husband in the course of one of those expeditions which took her into every part of paris during this time vauvinet had been paid and the pension of six thousand francs was almost redeemed victorin could maintain his mother as well as hortense out of the ten thousand francs interest on the money left by marshal hulot in trust for them adeline's salary amounted to six thousand francs a year and this added to the baron's pension when it was freed would presently secure an income of twelve thousand francs a year to the mother and daughter thus the poor woman would have been almost happy but for her perpetual anxieties as to the baron's fate for she longed to have him with her to share the improved fortunes that smiled on the family and but for the constant sight of her forsaken daughter and but for the terrible thrusts constantly and unconsciously dealt her by lisbeth whose diabolical character had free course a scene which took place at the beginning of the month of march eighteen forty three will show the results of lisbeth's latent and persistent hatred still seconded as she always was by madame marneffe two great events had occurred in the marneffe household in the first place valerie had given birth to a stillborn child whose little coffin had cost her two thousand francs a year and then as to marneffe himself eleven months since this is the report given by lisbeth to the hulot family one day on her return from a visit of discovery at the hotel marneffe this morning said she that dreadful valerie sent for dr bianchon to ask whether the medical men who had condemned her husband yesterday had made no mistake bianchon pronounced that to-night at the latest that horrible creature will depart to the torments that await him old crevel and madame marneffe saw the doctor out and your father my dear celestine gave him five gold pieces for his good news when he came back into the drawing-room crevel cut capers like a dancer he embraced that woman exclaiming then at last you will be madame crevel and to me when she had gone back to her husband's bedside for he was at his last gasp your noble father said to me with valerie as my wife i can become a peer of france i shall buy an estate i have my eye on presle which madame de serizy wants to sell i shall be crevel de presle member of the common council of seine oise and deputy i shall have a son i shall be everything i have ever wished to be eh, said i and what about your daughter 
bah says he she is only a woman and she is quite too much of an hulot valerie has a horror of them all my son-in-law has never chosen to come to this house why has he given himself such airs as a mentor a spartan a puritan a philanthropist besides i have squared accounts with my daughter she has had all her mother's fortune and two hundred thousand francs to that so i am free to act as i please i shall judge of my son-in-law and celestine by their conduct on my marriage as they behave so shall i if they are nice to their stepmother i will receive them i am a man after all in short all this rhodomontade and an attitude like napoleon on the column the ten months widowhood insisted on by the law had now elapsed some few days since the estate of presles was purchased victorin and celestine had that very morning sent lisbeth to make inquiries as to the marriage of the fascinating widow to the mayor of paris now a member of the common council of the department of seine -Oise. celestine and hortense in whom the ties of affection had been drawn closer since they had lived under the same roof were almost inseparable the baroness carried away by a sense of honesty which led her to exaggerate the duties of her place devoted herself to the work of charity of which she was the agent she was out almost every day from eleven till five the sisters-in-law united in their cares for the children whom they kept together sat at home and worked they had arrived at the intimacy which thinks aloud and were a touching picture of two sisters one cheerful and the other sad the less happy of the two handsome lively high-spirited and clever seemed by her manner to defy her painful situation while the melancholy celestine sweet and calm and as equable as reason itself might have been supposed to have some secret grief it was this contradiction perhaps that added to their warm friendship each supplied the other with what she lacked seated in a little summer-house in the garden which the speculator's trowel had spared by some fancy of the builders who believed that he was preserving these hundred feet square of earth for his own pleasure they were admiring the first green shoots of the lilac trees a spring festival which can only be fully appreciated in paris when the inhabitants have lived for six months oblivious of what vegetation means among the cliffs of stone where the ocean of humanity tosses to and fro celestine said hortense to her sister-in-law who had complained that in such fine weather her husband should be kept at the chamber i think you do not fully appreciate your happiness victorin is a perfect angel and you sometimes torment him my dear men like to be tormented certain ways of teasing are a proof of affection if your poor mother had only been i will not say exacting but always prepared to be exacting you would not have had so much to grieve over lisbeth is not come back i shall have to sing the song of malbrouck said hortense i do long for some news of wenceslas what does he live on he has not done a thing these two years victorin saw him he told me with that horrible woman not long ago and he fancied that she maintains him in idleness if you only would dear soul you might bring your husband back to you yet hortense shook her head believe me celestine went on the position will ere long be intolerable in the first instance rage despair indignation gave you strength the awful disasters that have come upon us since two deaths ruin and the disappearance of baron hulot have occupied your mind and heart but now you live in peace and silence you will find it hard to bear the void in your life and as you cannot and will never leave the path of virtue you will have to be reconciled to wenceslas victorin who loves you so much is of that opinion there is something stronger than one's feelings even and that is nature but such a mean creature 
cried the proud hortense he cares for that woman because she feeds him and has she paid his debts do you suppose good heaven i think of that man's position day and night he is the father of my child and he is degrading himself but look at your mother my dear said celestine celestine was one of those women who when you have given them reasons enough to convince a breton peasant still go back for the hundredth time to their original argument the character of her face somewhat flat dull and common her light brown hair in stiff neat bands her very complexion spoke of a sensible woman devoid of charm but also devoid of weakness the baroness would willingly go to join her husband in his disgrace to comfort him and hide him in her heart from every eye celestine went on why she has a room made ready upstairs for monsieur hulot as if she expected to find him and bring him home from one day to the next oh yes my mother is sublime replied hortense she has been so every minute of every day for six-and-twenty years but i am not like her it is not my nature how can i help it i am angry with myself sometimes but you do not know celestine what it would be to make terms with infamy there is my father said celestine placidly he has certainly started on the road that ruined yours he is ten years younger than the baron to be sure and was only a tradesman but how can it end this madame marneffe has made a slave of my father he is her dog she is mistress of his fortune and his opinions and nothing can open his eyes i tremble when i remember that their bans of marriage are already published my husband means to make a last attempt he thinks it a duty to try to avenge society and the family and bring that woman to account for all her crimes alas my dear hortense such lofty souls as victorin and hearts like ours come too late to a comprehension of the world and its ways this is a secret dear and i have told you because you are interested in it but never by a word or a look betray it to lisbeth or your mother or anybody for here is lisbeth said hortense well cousin and how is the inferno of the rue barbet going on badly for you my children your husband my dear hortense is more crazy about that woman than ever and she i must own is madly in love with him your father dear celestine is gloriously blind that to be sure is nothing i have had occasion to see it once a fortnight really i am lucky never to have had anything to do with men they are besotted creatures five days hence you dear child and victorin will have lost your father's fortune then the bands are cried said celestine yes said lisbeth and i have just been arguing your case i pointed out to that monster who is going the way of the other that if he would only get you out of the difficulties you are in by paying off the mortgage on your house you would show your gratitude and receive your stepmother hortense started in horror victorin will see about that said celestine coldly but do you know what monsieur le maire's answer was said lisbeth i mean to leave them where they are horses can only be broken in by lack of food sleep and sugar why baron hulot was not so bad as monsieur crevel so my poor dears you may say good-bye to the money and such a fine fortune your father paid three million francs for the presle estate and he has thirty thousand francs a year in stocks oh he has no secrets from me he talks of buying the hotel des navarins in the rue du bac madame marneffe herself has forty thousand francs a year ah here is our guardian angel here comes your mother she exclaimed hearing the rumble of wheels and presently the baroness came down the garden steps and joined the party at fifty-five though crushed by so many troubles and constantly trembling as if shivering with ague adeline whose face was indeed pale and wrinkled still had a fine figure a noble outline and natural dignity those who saw her said 
she must have been beautiful worn with the grief of not knowing her husband's fate of being unable to share with him this oasis in the heart of paris this peace and seclusion and the better fortune that was dawning on the family her beauty was the beauty of a ruin as each gleam of hope died out each day of search proved vain adeline sank into fits of deep melancholy that drove her children to despair the baroness had gone out that morning with fresh hopes and was anxiously expected an official who was under obligations to hulot to whom he owed his position and advancement declared that he had seen the baron in a box at the ambigu comique theatre with a woman of extraordinary beauty so adeline had gone to call on the baron verneuil this important personage while asserting that he had positively seen his old patron and that his behaviour to the woman indicated an illicit establishment told madame hulot that to avoid meeting him the baron had left long before the end of the play he looked like a man at home with the damsel but his dress betrayed some lack of means said he in conclusion well said the three women as the baroness came towards them well monsieur hulot is in paris and to me said adeline it is a gleam of happiness only to know that he is within reach of us but he does not seem to have mended his ways lisbeth remarked when adeline had finished her report of her visit to baron verneuil he has taken up some little work girl but where can he get the money from i could bet that he begs of his former mistresses mademoiselle jenny cadine or josepha the baroness trembled more severely than ever every nerve quivered she wiped away the tears that rose to her eyes and looked mournfully up to heaven i cannot think that a grand commander of the legion of honor will have fallen so low said she for his pleasure what would he not do said lisbeth he robbed the state he will rob private persons commit murder who knows oh lisbeth cried the baroness keep such thoughts to yourself at this moment louise came up to the family group now increased by the arrival of the two hulot children and little wenceslas to see if their grandmother's pockets did not contain some sweetmeats what is it louise asked one and another a man who wants to see mademoiselle fischer who is the man asked lisbeth he is in rags mademoiselle and covered with flue like a mattress picker his nose is red and he smells of brandy he is one of those men who work half of the week at most this uninviting picture had the effect of making lisbeth hurry into the courtyard of the house in the rue louis le grand where she found a man smoking a pipe colored in a style that showed him an artist in tobacco why have you come here pere chardin she asked it is understood that you go on the first saturday in every month to the gate of the hotel marneffe rue barbet de jouy i have just come back after waiting there for five hours and you did not come i did go there good and charitable lady replied the mattress-picker but there was a game at pool going on in the cafe des savants rue de cerf volant and every man has his fancy now mine is billiards if it wasn't for billiards i might be eating off silver plate for i tell you this and he fumbled for a scrap of paper in his ragged trousers pocket it is billiards that leads on to a dram and plum brandy it is ruinous like all fine things in the things it leads to i know your orders but the old un is in such a quandary that i came on to forbidden grounds if the hair was all hair we might sleep sound on it but it is mixed god is not for all as the saying goes he has his favorites well he has the right now here is the writing of your estimable relative and my very good friend his political opinion chardin attempted to trace some zigzag lines in the air with the forefinger of his right hand lisbeth not listening to him read these few words dear cousin be my providence give me three hundred francs this day hector what does he want so much money for 
the landlord said chardin still trying to sketch arabesques and then my son you see has come back from algiers through spain and bayonnet and and he has found nothing against his rule for a sharp cove is my son saving your presence how can he help it he is in want of food but he will repay all we lend him for he is going to get up a company he has ideas he has that will carry him to the police court lisbeth put in he murdered my uncle i shall not forget that he why he could not bleed a chicken honorable lady here are the three hundred francs said lisbeth taking fifteen gold pieces out of her purse now go and never come here again she saw the father of the oran storekeeper off the premises and pointed out the drunken old creature to the porter at any time when that man comes here if by chance he should come again do not let him in if he should ask whether m hulot junior or madame la baronne hulot lives here tell him you know of no such persons very good mademoiselle your place depends on it if you make any mistake even without intending it said lisbeth in the woman's ear cousin she went on to victorin who just now came in a great misfortune is hanging over your head what is that said victorin within a few days madame marneffe will be your wife's stepmother that remains to be seen replied victorin for six months past lisbeth had very regularly paid a little allowance to baron hulot her former protector whom she now protected she knew the secret of his dwelling-place and relished adeline's tears saying to her as we have seen when she saw her cheerful and hopeful you may expect to find my poor cousin's name in the papers some day under the heading police report but in this as on a former occasion she let her vengeance carry her too far she had aroused the prudent suspicions of victorin he had resolved to be rid of this damocles sword so constantly flourished over them by lisbeth and of the female demon to whom his mother and the family owed so many woes the prince de wissembourg knowing all about madame marneffe's conduct approved of the young lawyer's secret project he had promised him as a president of the council can promise the secret assistance of the police to enlighten crevel and rescue a fine fortune from the clutches of the diabolical courtesan whom he could not forgive either for causing the death of marshal hulot or for the baron's utter ruin End of chapter thirty two